<clears throat> yeah, so often the term insight is uh, connected to Buddhist meditation. You know, sometimes people don't really even want to call it Buddhist, but insight meditation. Or sometimes they don't want to call it meditation, just straight insight. <laughs> You get insight movements and vipassana, interesting vipassana, which is the Pali word for insight. Uh, and uh, it is, of course, uh, it was always considered to be the real kind of final un- unfolding of the meditative process. It's like um, not something you start with, but something that becomes possible and Gradually, as your your awareness becomes more steady and stable, there can be this kind of unfolding of a, of, a, of a, an amazing um, uh, freedom and release from the various uh, ways in which our reality gets structured. You know, this isn't this is not a small thing. Actually, <laughs> you're dealing with the way that your very sense of yourself and the world is experienced. Is, is a very major uh, thing because, you know, most of all of us will say, well, here I am, this is me, and there's everybody else out there, and that's obvious, isn't it? We'll all agree upon that, you yeah? But the understanding of insight is no. <laughs> that's, not, that's actually not, not entirely accurate, you know. Where, where's the line? Where's the boundary? You know, where does me end, you know? In the visual field, the auditory field, I can hear sounds out there that are happening here. There are sights out there. How come I'm aware of them in here? You know, where am I in all this? If I'm in here, how come I can see things out there? Am I looking out from in here, looking out through the eyes? And how come I can hear things as well and think things? Where are the thoughts occurring? In here somewhere? You know, and how come that memories happen and impressions happen, and where are, the, where are the edges between me and what happens to me? Yeah, and we really begin to get the sense of, uh, you know, the very subjective experience we have is can, is dependently arising upon all kinds of th- forms and sensations and forms of consciousness. Sounds, sights, perceptions, impressions, inclinations, attitudes, all kind of intermeshing. Yeah. There's no clear edge to it of this is me and everything else is out there. Yeah. So this, uh, this is a kind of unfolding of that because it does... Uh, it's not just interesting, but it also helps to um, dismantle the, some of the major uh, obstacles to human happiness, which is the sense of separateness and dominance and uh, alienation and uh, needs to control anxieties. Um, yeah. And also the kind of feeling of vacuity, like what am I, what can I be, what, how can I feel, what can I become, you know. Something out there is going to fill me up. Um, so it's that kind of hunger for things. Sound, sights, news, information, sensations, something to kind of keep me going. Without that, life looks pretty bleak. Mm. Yeah. So all this occurs really based upon the, the setup that 
here am I as a discrete, separate entity, and there's a world out there. Yeah. So I'm constantly in that feeling of separateness. I'm looking for something out there to put in. And what I've got in here, I want to put it out there and make sure it happens. Yeah. You know, my beliefs, my, my ideas, my plans, I want to get them out there and make sure it works. And it isn't going <laughs> to, you realize it doesn't do it. <laughs> and then the things out there, I want to put them in here. The nice things, the interesting things, the pleasant things, I want to put them in here. And they don't stay in here. And there's also all kinds of not very pleasant things coming in, in here. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, you know, it's it, the structure is wrong. Somehow, the need, with the insight, the cultivation insight, you can begin to this flowering of awareness, whereby your awareness can allow things to arise and pass. Sounds so simple, you know. What does it take to experience a painful feeling, let it arise and pass? What does it take to experience a crazy thought, and let it arise and pass? What does it take to feel something not going your own way, the way you'd like it, have that happen to you, and let it arise and pass? Not shutting it down, not following, which is letting it move through. What does it take, you know? Is there some sense of, isn't that a release of some kind? And what is that that can do that? So we talk about things like awareness or transcendence. You try and grab hold of that one. There's another frustrating experience. <laughs> you can only be doing it, you can't really have it. <laughs> you can only be doing it. As you do it, you're feeling more confident more free, more open, more compassionate, clearer, <coughs> more steady, and you get the results, which is exactly what the process is about. But insight, the cultivation of insight, does depend itself upon practices like calming, steadying, so your attention becomes more steady and calm, uh, clarifying your intentions, your know, general motivation, so you're looking for accuracy, um, looking for what's really true, rather than just, you know, looking for something exciting or thrilling. And you're looking to, to, um, to do some practice, you know, to work on it, because it's worthwhile. It depends on these, and this is the basis for it. Uh, you know, it's what we're doing in meditation: is building up this basis, being able to sustain attention, sustain intention, and uh, you know, experience some quality of, of benefit in doing that. Because if it doesn't feel good, we're not going to do it. So it's, we've got to work on that fundamental sense of you know, the structure of self. I want to feel good, I want to be clearer, I want to uh, um, have some motivation. You have to work on that, that structure, until eventually the structure itself can begin to be explored and, and uh, released. Mm. So, I've just been, so I've had a couple of weeks on uh, solitary retreat and uh, my worst fears were confirmed <laughs> that anything you take personally is going to cause you suffering <laughs> but also that rather glad that one can actually find a way of putting it down and relaxing out of that you know, yeah. so this is the uh, you know what becomes possible. It's a kind of we talk about the difference between awareness and mind. Although these this is just you can you may find fault with those terms, they're not exactly clear, but looking in terms of the, the activities, 
such as thoughts, feelings, impressions, that that sense that we things we do, you know, thoughts, our moods, our inclinations, all that active stuff that's moving along. And then you also recognize you've got something there, can we can call it listening or watching or witnessing or open to or receptive to that. So you can, in your so-called mind, you can be aware of your mind, can't you? You can be aware of a thought and a feeling. And that's the kind of, that's often the pivot point for meditation. When you can't do that, when you're just in it, in the thoughts, in the feelings, this is not meditation, this is just more activities. But the, the real, you know, fundamental requirement is to be able to be aware of thoughts, feelings and impressions. And that's quite crucial. Mm. And over time, that, that quality of being able to be aware becomes steadier and more, more innate, more established, and then you can begin to review, which is what insight does. You start to review, who am I? Mm. Who is here? Mm. Mm. Looking into the experience of selfhood, an experience we all have. An experience that's quite uh, valid in many respects, you know, for conventional life, and yet does not resolve the fundamental problem of suffering and stress, separation, aloneness, birth, death, um, desire, you know, wanting things, um, willpower, trying to get what I want, not going to get what I want. Relationships with other people, struggling, bonding, separation from the loved, and so on. It doesn't actually resolve it all. But insight does. As in you're able to be with, be open to, not get caught in feelings, perceptions, intentions, impressions. You can let those move through. And begin to see and get a feeling for, you know, the wrong basis, the, the confusions that cause these uh, these natural functions to become problems. So when we are able to just acknowledge, you know, the sense of I. If you look at self, really, myself, and it really comes down to three fundamental positions. There's I, and I is the experience of agency. I do. Just in terms of language, you know, I go, I, you know, I activate, I'm the agent. You know. And then the second basis is me. Me is the experience that something happens to me. I'm the object. So with I am the subject, me is the object. Something happens to me. And the third place is myself, which is the overall sense of history. Historical person moving along through time, myself. When I was five years old, I was this, I was that. So we could sometimes use the same terms, I, me, myself, but really they're three, rather three different experiences. Myself is an overview. So you can say, I'm not feeling myself today. I don't feel quite myself. Well, who do you feel then? <laughs> it means the particular agency of the present moment isn't in touch with my background impression of what I assess myself as being. Mm. Yeah. See, myself is a historical impression, right? You know? Isn't it? Yeah. Something that carries through in time. I am the agent, me is the thing that's acted upon, myself is the the overall impression. And those in, in uh, when they're 
And those are quite, <clears throat> you know, things that we experience and have their, their relevance. But it's to recognize that none of them are actually inherently true, inherently independent, inherently some core being. I is a constantly changing experience. It, it always appends, it always sticks on something. You know, I go, I make, I eat, I sleep. You, know, you can't have an I that just stands on its own. It's always got to be doing something. So this is called intention, intentionality, volition, intention, volition. Volition is natural, volition is important, volition is what we have, volition is not to be denied, but volition, when it's understood as volition or intention, the motivation, rather than willfulness, I want to get what I want, I want to have things go my way. I look at the quality of intention. Is this intention accompanied by aggression, uh, arrogance, uh, pride, generosity, kindness? What's it accompanied by? So you purify it. Whereas if it's just allowed everything, if it's not examined, if it's seen as me, as I, we don't check it. We don't check it. And particularly when you get ideologies that say, well, I believe in my free expression, you know, to be myself. And, uh, you know, so there's this sense of what is that as an experience? The urge to do. Volition, intention. And so, okay, Rather than making it some fundamental inherent essence of my identity, that then I'm very biased towards believing in it, yeah, and cherishing it and making it, you know, giving it power. Yeah. No, I don't have to get what I want all the time. That's getting what I want. And it's not getting what I want. And you start to see, actually, getting what I want is not satisfying. It doesn't finally get anywhere. And getting what I don't want isn't satisfying either. So, can the intention just to be to aim for what's good? Just to lift up to what's good. To incline to what's good. If you say something like, I want to, I'm going to cook a meal, right? Do you think that intention can do it? Do you think just on that alone you're going to do it? Doesn't it need things like food, gas, pans, uh, time? Things that you, that intention has no control over. I can't say let there be food. <laughs> I can only say well you know, if things come together and some of that's pretty, uh, you know, changeable, then I can act. So my sense of intention is rather more modest and flexible and uh, humble than willful. So, you know, and a lot of my intention is that then going to be more, more motivated to how can skillful conditions come together rather than I want. How can skillful conditions come together? How can appropriate relationships occur? How can, you know, what's going to come out of this? So it's much wiser. And so your intentions become wiser and less um, idealistic, less willful, less blind. And you can recognize sometimes my intentions aren't that good. You know? But that doesn't have to be a final damning statement of my identity. It's just to recognize it's, uh, this thing needs handling carefully, needs wise attention. You know, sometimes you get intentions towards greed or to intentions associated with dismissiveness, and you, oh, that's that one. Okay, 
or that one side, because it's not seen. When you begin to see it just as a something that arises, rather than something you've got to prove or defend or make perfect, then it's a lot healthier that way. Me, the one who things happen to. Hmm. Who's that? So when sounds happen to me, is that the same one as, is that the same person as the one who sights happen to? Who thoughts happen to? Hmm. Hmm. So you hear something pleasant, pleasant sound, me feels pleased. Hmm. Unpleasant sight, me feels displeased. Feels, you yeah. Now, you can have both of those occurring pretty much one after the other. So the me sense is like um, something's just constantly receiving impressions. And naturally we'd like it to be stable. We'd like it to be steady. But as you know, as much as you can do to make it steady by living in a quiet place or a meditation centre or whatever, still what happens is that the me has to experience memory. Uh, things happen, feelings, emotions, uh, psychological stuff happens to me. And it's not stable. So we, what does really me mean as a direct experience? It's feeling and perception. Perceptions are impressions. Feelings are felt tones, pleasant, unpleasant. So you know, friendliness happens. Um, pleasant impressions happen. Disagreeable impressions happen. Mm. Some are pleasing, some are displeasing. Mm. Perceptions, impressions based upon anticipations of the future, they happen. Perceptions and impressions based upon memories of the past, they happen. All those things happen. But the nature is to be changing. There isn't some me there. Now, whether you really get the sense of this, this isn't to deny that one is sensitive, but to recognize you can't have this me as something that's going to be stable or independent. It's always going to be affected by things that happen. And some of those will be disagreeable, and some will be agreeable, and some will be nothing special. You know, it never gets better, it never gets more than that, it never gets different from that. <laughs> Wherever you live, it comes down to the same thing. Pleasant, unpleasant, and so what? (laughs) And that's about as good as you can get. (laughs) So so what's going to fulfill me? What's going to keep me happy? If it looked like, and that in that breakdown, statistically, it's only a third. <laughs> Two thirds of it's either nothing much or unpleasant. But the point of understanding as perception and feelings is that you can be aware of perceptions and feelings, yeah. and awareness is like a almost like a parasympathetic sense. So. Sympathetic sense means something happens and you're affected by it. Yeah. Sound happens and you're affected by it. You're shocked, you're pleased, you're delighted, you're disappointed. That's the sympathetic effect. You know, Something happens and you get this resonance. Parasympathetic effect means you feel the resonance and you go, oh, okay, how do we get back to balance? Parasympathetic is just that which creates a holding place, a balance surveys the whole thing and says the real point of this is 
is uh, feeling that. It gets to the point, and how does it restores balance? Hmm? How do I manage discomfort? How do I manage aggression? How do I manage people being impolite? How do I how do I manage that? So instead of trying to sort everything else out in the world so that me will be okay and not impinged upon by unpleasant feelings, which is going to take a lot of doing. In fact, it can't be done. (laughs) Can I handle it? And that isn't done through changing the perceptions and impressions so much as being able to develop this capacity to get what's really touching the mind any particular moment and open around that in this parasympathetic or empathic way. And that's the function of awareness. So when you're aware of perceptions and feelings rather than trying to fix them, change them, hold on to them, have more of them, have less of them, then you find there's a place where you're you're always steady. Your steadiness grows. Your steadiness grows. And this is, you know, I don't expect to have a, a solid, stable feeling. Or a solid, stable me. Yes, you notice it's going through a day, you know, waking up, who's that? Oh, wait a minute, let's get it together, okay. Yeah. Freshening up, oh, I feel better now. Me's changed a bit. Yeah. Have a cup of tea, some breakfast, feeling quite perky, things looking good. This is great, yeah, fine, switch on, the, look at the news, oh no, and crash <laughs> down again. And <laughs> Remember something I've got to do, I'm getting a bit agitated, and then, oh, that's a good one, it's a nice letter came, somebody said there, Sent me a birthday card, oh, cheered up again, that's great. And then, oh no, <laughs> something's gone wrong. <laughs> it just does that. You know, uh, that feeling of perception, we're, we're, um, we're sensitive. And you know, the funny thing is the more that you, you meditate, the more you get more sensitive. <laughs> you know, more, you know, so that you, it takes on even more of that you know and sometimes just trying to give these little tiny little flies I think they're some kind of night flies almost very fragile little creatures I'm trying to fish one out of a of a sink you know and it's got its wings stuck and trying to do it without hurting the thing and worrying it you know. I mean you know <laughs> you kind of care so much about everything yeah, and uh, concerned about how these creatures get in and get damaged, and you know, you know just, just <laughs> it's like that that creatures get damaged. <laughs> you know, creatures get damaged. Then you look at the world, the human world, and oh, and really, in a sense, is it's not possible to live without catastrophe. Is it? You know? It'd be nice if it was, but I haven't noticed it. There's always somebody blowing up, slaughter going on, wars, mistrust, violence, crime. And just even in families, you know, somebody's getting, not listening to somebody else, somebody's sulking, somebody's having a breakdown, somebody's being nasty, you know, it's all these kind of things going on. And you want it all to be nice and quiet and steady and smooth and calm. And sure, you know, one's intentions can do that, but you realize eventually you just got to basically get big enough to handle and cope with the stress of life, the impingement of it. And how we get wound up about it feel responsible for it. We've got to make it work. Me. We're trapped in this. <laughs> you know. 
So the, but the sympathetic, the parasympathetic, the empathic sense is feeling trapped. That's where me is at the moment. Oh, how's that? Tight in the chest, tight in the throat, aware of that, aware of that, widening, softening, taking that in, aware of that, not making anything more, not just trying to get rid of it, not trying to change it. You know, (laughs) so (laughs) shifts. by holding it in awareness, but as long as it's me, something wrong with me, I shouldn't be like this. Perception and feeling, very powerful, very poignant. We're permeable, there's no real boundary. We, we don't end at the end of our skin. It's just, stuff is just hurtling through us. Constantly. Hmm. To eventually recognize it's not hurtling through anybody in particular, it's just hurtling through consciousness. <laughs> and consciousness is, is more what set myself is. No. So third place uh, that we, you know, it gets corrupted is the process of consciousness, or I call it awareness. Mm. which is that very you can say the kind of container of it all you know that which can know witness it all Mm. when this is taken as myself when this is imagined to be myself then we wonder what happens when I die. Um, how did I get here? Um, what's the purpose of myself? What should what am I supposed to be? Uh, what am I? Who am I? What, how did I get to be? What will I be? Is everybody like this? Where's the edge of it? You know, is it myself? Is it separate from the world or part of the world? Is it infinite, infinite self, or half infinite? Sort of sometimes infinite, sometimes not infinite. <laughs> Where does it exist in time? Is it historical, non historical? Does it unite with God or some divine presence at the termination of his life? Where does myself go to? Where does it come from? How did it get here? Have I got a destiny? I was kind of sent here by some divine presence to go through this life and learn. Is that it? What am I supposed to learn anyway? (laughs) Why did he send me here? (laughs) So you get these kind of speculative experiences. uh, But you can, this is where it's corrupted by trying to locate it or name it as a personal presence. Because when you really contemplate, you know, that that overriding sense of, well, I'm here. I don't know what I am, but I'm here. You know, the here-ness. Where's that? Hmm? Is it in your body? Is it in the thought? Is it in this room? If I'm here in this room, is that a different here than if I go outside? Seems to be when I'm here outside, then I'm still here, aren't I? (laughs) So it's a here that has no location. How can here have no location? What kind of a finite presence is that that you can't locate? And then, does it, so it has no location. Let's have a centre to it. You know, who's the real, in that sense of presence, of being aware, of being open, being sensitive to things? Hmm? 
What's the center of it? You know? Perhaps it's the kind of hunger to be filled with something, a questioning. What am I? What next? Hmm? This is nice. Hmm? Is that something permanent? Is that some sort of self? Or is it just another thought? Can be aware without being aware of anything? Or are we aware of thoughts, impressions, sensations, ideas? So if I'm aware of my mind, which one am I? My mind or my awareness? <laughs> so I've got in my, you know, when you start to speculate about awareness, you always find yourself, what's happening is it begins to fill up with doubt, speculation, anticipations, ideas, and you can be aware of those. And every time you're aware of it, that idea, that speculation, that doubt falls away and you're left with, oh, so that wasn't it, so what is? That's a doubt, isn't it? <laughs> so you can never find it. You can't say it's, when you, it's a here that has no location. And if it's something that's really myself, it's solid, it must have a boundary, an edge to it, mustn't it? You know, it's something like a tree or a car or a rock. It's definitely, you know, it's there and then it stops as an edge to it. You try and find the edge to awareness. Because hmm? whatever you're aware of becomes the centre point, doesn't it? So if you're aware, that's something that's around the edge of my awareness and you turn to it, it's no longer on the edge of awareness, it's in the middle of it, right? It's like you try to look at the edge of your vision. It's like, where did it go? It keeps moving around, doesn't it? Every time you go to the edge of it, whatever's at the edge becomes the centre of your vision. And awareness is not like that. You can't find an edge to it, because the edge becomes the centre. So something's got no edge, no centre, no, no location. What kind of self is that? <laughs> but you notice whenever the sense of self takes over that, the edges build up. <laughs> Don't they? You know, this is mine, this is what I am. I'm not that. Yeah. The edge the resistance is built up. So you get the mine sense. This is mine. Which is a kind of resistance is holding on, builds up. When uh, you recognize that, here I am taking a stand on this is what I am. I'm male, I'm British, I'm this, I'm that, this is myself. Then you get the pride or the arrogance or the dismissiveness or whatever. You know? No, you're not. You're aware of that, that's all. And those edges, definitions, boundaries fall away. The edges, the definitions, the boundaries fall away. So what kind of self is it? It's got no definition, no boundary, no location. Why call it a self? Why not just say it's aware? And uh, use it. So turning, when you begin to see and go through the process of, of exploration, which is what insight's about, it begins to <coughs> transform attitudes, fundamental assumptions about holding, about attaining, about acquiring, about dismissing, about endings of things about pushing things away, about holding on to things, it tends to undermine the basis on which those activities, those inclinations occur. And these are the inclinations that create stress and suffering. And it's through undermining the aims and attitudes that those inclinations rest upon 
that we find this peace that can't really be named or defined or located as a state but the peace to be able to encompass experience as it happens and to hmm? and this is what the Buddha was aiming at yeah. the arising, the passing of experience without hanging on without getting thrown by it without craving it without dismissing it then the, then that freedom and in, your intention has a great sense of courage fearlessness and love because it doesn't doesn't matter anymore you're not trying to have or be something. You just want to let that intentionality, while it's still, while we still have that, while it's still present, we bring it to what's good and helpful. And we don't expect it's going to work exactly, but we bring it forth. It comes forth in appropriate time and circumstance. It comes forth. So... In a way, you have something that allows both this kind of more dissolved or ultimate state of openness and also the relative state of my activities with all their limitations and so forth. Still, we act. And we act without that sense of it's got to be exactly the way I want it to be or push my way through this no matter what or I don't know whether this is going to anybody else likes this you come clearer about what's accompanying your intention so both of these aspects are really important to live a healthy happy integrated life to have that refuge in awareness and to have the way of supervising being clear about intentions in you. Mm-hmm. So insight is really <clears throat> the ability to keep exploring where where the holding on occurs, where the sticking places occur, where this uh, process of liberation is getting trapped, stuck. And certainly in terms of, uh, you know, meditation, uh, it's, it's kind of like a limitless, you know. Because you can do meditations that calm the mind, but after all you get a bit bored with being calm. <laughs> so what? <laughs> you know, you can keep doing systems and techniques you can get quite good at, but after a while you think, so, okay, you know, I can do all these refined things and yeah so what and uh, certainly on retreats just looking at thoughts and feelings and so forth after about you know a month of looking at that you're thinking yeah well I'd like to look at something else for a while <laughs> I've seen all this stuff before <laughs> yeah. but What's really helpful is to find you've got that constant interest in it, inquiring into it. You know, who is this? How does he get caught? What's winding me up now? You know, you know, what's happening in the body when that happens? How is that triggered by? What triggers that? What's it like to be on my own? What's it like when nothing's happening? Which is like when lots of things are happening. Noticing these effects. And noticing these effects in a, in a way to, um, to find the end of suffering in it all. So the end of suffering can't be just some kind of, you know, one-off experience if you only experience in a certain time, certain place. Because that's not much of, a, of an end, is it? It's always something that widens to include 
you know, all of your life and fundamentally your sense of self because that's what you're carrying 24-7, isn't it? Your sense of who you are. That becomes the ultimate meditation object. Because <laughs> that's the one you... <laughs> It's there all the time. You can live with it. It's not really a system or a technique. It's not not a Buddhist self. It's just the this. <laughs> it's not a hobby. It's a life. Uh, so insight is both, uh, in some ways, the most basic uh, theme, and it's also the most in- intelligent theme, the most uh, far-reaching. So, you know, you take a few moments and noticing whatever you're doing comes the end of doing something. What's the results of that? Uh Notice particularly the endings of things. Finish talking, finish eating. How's that? What's the feelings and perceptions that are there? you're about to do something before you do it just that moment of pause who's that? who is she? how does he feel in my how does his body feel with that one? what kind of attitudes come up with that? how does it feel? that volition is it oh my god I'll hurry up when I do this how's that one? Is it, well, you know, you've got to, people keep wanting this, I've got to keep doing this. How's that one? What's it like when it's, oh, I'm going to do that one. What's that one like? So you get to the point of checking these. And whoever he or she is at that particular moment, can I be aware of that, open to that, relax with that, pause with that, Learn something with that. Guide it carefully. Yeah. Look at the beginnings of things. That's where intention comes. Look at the endings of things. That's where perceptions and feelings come. Yeah. And look particularly at the global statement of my life. This is who I am. That's where the unresolved um, resistances and assessments and judgments are. Through really understanding them, seeing them as they are, holding them carefully, empathically, these can dissolve. So in a way, insight is something you can practice in three minutes. And, uh, you know, one should practice it like in, in ten seconds. Who's this? Hmm. How's it feeling now? That. Where's the future now? Where are we going? What am I anticipating now? What am I worrying about? What that kind of underlying dis-ease, what's that, who's that? Something I should have said, done, been, wish I wasn't, wish I was. What's that? Hmm? So it's both, you know, the most instant and immediate and the most deepest and all of the practices that we do are really to enable that, uh, that unerring, gentle inquiry to get to the point of now where the release is from stress. Anyone?